I want to say, first of all, thank you to all of you out there who are watching these episodes and who are writing me. I'm getting lots and lots of emails with, uh, with very generous compliments and also with requests for things to, uh, to discuss and, and possibly elaborate on things that I already have discussed, which I'm happy to do. So if you have any ideas or any suggestions, uh, lay them on me. You can reach me through briangutenbergart.com and go to the contact links and uh, you can write me there. I really enjoy this format, so uh, thank you very much for watching, and uh, I'll continue to do more of these. I was asked to talk a little further on how I learned color, and uh, <laughs> uh, th there's nothing more deadly dull than reading a book on color. I'm often asked if I can recommend such, and I cannot. Uh, I've never read a book on color. I learn color not from art. I learn color from a very specific place, a very specific geography, the coast of South Carolina where I was born and raised, the Low Country. And I, I think the antecedent to learning color and to learning how to paint was learning how to see. And those are the things that, that early on I was able to glean from growing up in such a place. Such an, uh, such an attachment to a specific place. Uh, I remember my grandfather would take me out in the backyard and, and when the azaleas would bloom in the spring. And I, would, I was probably five or six, and I would walk up to the bushes and just bury my face in the petals, the hot pink and the purple, uh, to burn the color into my retina. I had to fill my entire eye and my face up to my ears with color, with pure saturated color. Uh, it, that, that total immersion into saturated color, I think, is still one of the primary engines in my work today, 40, 41 years later. Um, I remember I'd ride my bike to the 7-Eleven and get a pack of M&Ms, and then I'd bring them home and scatter them out all over on top of a white countertop. And the colors, the range of colors, the sequence of colors, would just send chills up my spine. It wasn't... It didn't seem random to me because the things I was responding to were little couplets, little groupings of colors trios, quartets, uh, and those groups of colors spoke to me uh, like language speaks. Uh, and I, I just remember being very attached and very attracted to groupings of colors, those, again, those pure kind of saturated colors, uh, and then I could eat them after. <laughs> um, it's, it's the same reason I like car lots. I like to go to car lots uh, because there's row after row after row of gleaming, shiny, brand new colors. Uh, and they don't seem random to me because the things I respond to, uh, I only take away what strikes me, what speaks to me. So uh, it seems to be, you know, with the eye of a painter, we, we seek to imprint a certain order amidst chaos. So I don't find these things random. I find them very, very logical and very uh, uh, linear almost. The way that I see things, I respond to certain combinations of colors and I'll take them. I'll put them in my tackle box and those things will come out later in paintings and they'll be part of my, my ongoing uh, development of a vocabulary in color. And it is a vocabulary. Um, golf courses. I grew up, uh, you know, uh, I don't really particularly care much for golf, but we used to fish on golf courses uh, into late into the evening. And I remember it was just, you know, planes and planes and planes of beautiful saturated permanent green. Uh, it was a great way to learn color, was to, to hang out on golf courses. Um, I grew up in a resort town, so there were arcades, there were uh, amusement parks, all full of buzzing neon lights and colors. And those things taught me about color uh, and the movement of color. So I've always been highly sensitive to, to hue and to intensity of color, uh, and then to the arrangement of those things all together to speak in a very clear, very vibrant language. And those are all things, um, again, that helped me learn how to see far before I knew there was anything, you know, called painting or, or, or the possibility that one could have a career in painting, um, was learning how to see. And again, it's very much tied to a place. Um, and you notice a lot of the things I've mentioned, uh, M&Ms, uh, car lots, uh, amusement parks, they're all, they all have to do with artifice. Um, and that's a very important component in my work, is the notion of the artificial. Uh, I've always said this, I don't believe there's any such thing as natural beauty. I, I don't think when Canadian geese are flying into a sunset, they think it's beautiful. 
beauty is a human invention, and it's not beautiful until a human being declares it so and appreciates it through their perceptions, through their desires, through their through the translation of that natural experience into an artificial language, the language of art, the language of proportion and color and line, and all the things we attribute to a work of art. Uh, I, I suppose every single work of art of any medium is, is highly dependent on the notion of artifice, that we are creating condensed artificial realities which will hopefully speak to something larger, something more truthful. Um, that will try to give us some sort of traction in this world and remind us that we are not alone, that we have each other. And also delight us with the sheer joy, the sheer pleasure of seeing, of looking. So again, in terms of learning color, I think it was more important that I learned how to see. Um, and that's what a very specific geography gave me, was that, that ability to see. And then later I could use that as my foundation in learning how to, uh, how to paint and how to use color. Uh, which I'm still learning and which I'll continue to do uh, for the rest of my life. So you can see the space is divided into two uh, with this long card table in the middle. That's the main work table and I have it, I have it uh, in order of materials like sandpaper and gloves for painting on this side. Then it moves over into the paint tubes, the large 150 milliliter paint tubes like this. Uh, then into the palettes, the traditional palettes I use, the mediums in this area, then the smaller paint tubes over here, like that. More specialized, more expensive colors, which I don't need as much of. And then it ends up with brushes on this side. So that's kind of the sequence and the way I work. Um, I'm a big guy, I'm six foot three. Um, so we had to raise the table up to be at a proper working height. And if you pan down, you can see that the table is resting on both ends on top of two uh, suitcases. And inside of those suitcases are the clothes that I moved to New York City in back in 1987 when uh, I came from South Carolina right out of college. Uh, I was 21, and uh, they still have the clothes and the supplies there I needed in case things didn't work out here, I could always move back. But I think it's safe to say uh, almost 25 years later that I won't be needing these, uh, these clothes, um, and I'll probably just end up leaving them to my kids, like time capsules. Uh, but that's a good example of, uh, it's a nice metaphor, uh, the notion that, that travel and that place is a support, uh, a metaphor for supporting my entire practice, the table that I work on. One of the earliest memories I have of being exposed to images of great Western painting was a book I had when I was about 10 or 11 years old on the sea paintings of Edouard Manet. Paintings like Battle at Sea and the Battle of the Kearsarge and the Alabama all from around 1864. You, you probably know the paintings I'm speaking of, but we'll put one or two up here on the screen for you to see. And uh, they're, they're, they're square and rectangular fields of turquoise and green water in which he would place black and pewter ships uh, in very carefully composed arrangements with smoke coming out of the side, uh, and full of, of, of stasis, but also the, the promise of movement. They're monumental. Um, they're, 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 they're uh, clean, stark images, which struck me very deeply at an early age. And I remember doing copies of these in acrylic over and over and over and over again. Uh, some of them are probably still in my parents' attic, so maybe next time I'm down south, I'll get some and bring them back and show them to you here. Uh, my desire, however, however, was to go beyond just the mimetic exercise of copying the, the manner and the color and the composition of those paintings. I would take a pillow and I would put over it a turquoise pillowcase, then I'd put it on a table and then take black and gray rocks uh, of, of varying scales, scales which corresponded to the sizes of the ships in the paintings, and I would place them in the order that they were in the paintings on the pillow. They would sink into the downy softness of the pillow. And it taught me a lot about, about spatial displacement and about uh, weight and counterweight uh, in composing a painting. Um, uh, and, and it, it just helped me to understand the mechanics of those compositions. Uh, uh, it, it alludes to things that Hoffman, of course, talks about, push and pull, and the notion of space as being elastic and pliable, and through color, through careful arrangements of, of both hue and intensity, one can suggest pictorial depth and space. And uh, th those are things I use to this day, you know, 30 plus years later. Every time I'm painting, I'm, I'm thinking about rocks and pillows. Thank you.